Enzo Shock Show. We are on episode number 27. And today I'm answering the question, uh, what are the ways to determine the resonance frequency in an ultrasonic transducer? So let's jump right in. So let's first really quickly recap what happens at the resonance. I've spent a couple of videos on different aspects of it, but let's just recap that before we dive uh, more deeply into uh, how to measure it. So uh, at the resonance frequency, we typically have the minimum impedance. That also means, you know, that's the voltage to current ratio. So that means you have the maximum current for an applied voltage. So you'll see your voltage or your current climb to a maximum at your resonance frequency. All right, nothing, nothing too, too uh, new there. You also get maximum power. And I described in an earlier shock show, you can, you know, search for a shock show the piezo shock show, uh, how to determine power, you'll come up with the video. Um, so you also at the resonance frequency you have maximum power. Uh, basically, that means it's also very related to the second point that the phase is the phase, there's, there's, you undergo a phase change at resonance. Now, ideally, if you had a really high quality factor and also, and or a high coupling factor, you would actually hit a zero degrees phase at resonance. That's not necessarily true. For uh, devices where the quality factor is on lower and that coupled with the coupling factor being smaller, and that's true for assembled devices, many assembled devices, you'll have uh, the, the phase not reaching zero, but you'll just hit a, hit a maximum phase and come back down. So that that the frequency of maximum phase change, it's a little bit harder to determine from uh, uh, in a lower coupling device. You probably ought to use power. Uh, but as we can kind of see here, uh, for a ideal resonator with high coupling and high Q, you go from negative 90 degrees, which is the capacitive phase, to zero to 90, which is the inductor. So this is where your resonance is. Back to zero, which is your anti-resonance, and then back to negative 90, continuing continuing on as a capacitor until you hit the next resonance. Um, alternatively, with a lower coupling factor, you'll get negative 60, uh, for example, or, or lower phase, or you may get zero, you know, you may get a maximum of zero degrees. It's not exactly gonna be your resonance point. Uh, but in that case, I would suggest using power, multiplying voltage and current, and finding the instantaneous or the average power for determining your maximum, uh, your, your, sorry, your resonance frequency. The next part is, uh, and this kind of goes out of sequence from the last two, is that it is a frequency of natural oscillation. This is also called the resonance frequency. It's also called the natural frequency of the system. So it's the frequency at which the system wants to operate. And really cool for piezoelectric materials or, or transducers that if you short circuit your device, that is the voltage is either controlled um, by an external voltage source, even if it's controlled in amplitude, like if you're varying the amplitude, but you're controlling it, but you have you have you have you you are controlling what the voltage is despite it's changing. You still control it. In that case, it's still considered a short circuit system or or you know short circuit. Sometimes gets people confused. So I'll say CV controlled voltage system, which also means if you short it, you control the voltage to zero. That's just a special case, the easy case. The open circuit is where you allow charge to develop due to uh, movement of the piezo that actually causes the anti-resonance frequency. So let's go with this first one. I just have to get it out of the plate. How do you measure the resonance frequency? Use an impedance analyzer. You look for the minimum point or more precisely, you look for the maximum conductance, the real admittance. But for most people, it's, it's just enough to know that the minimum resonance frequency, minimum impedance frequency is your resonance. And that's sh shown as a dip. The next one is using oscilloscope and a function generator. So I have a, a, a kind of popular video on YouTube already. It's kind of old, but it still shows the point that when you get your resonance frequency, you have maximum current, and you also have the phase change, which is then going to also be related to your power. So both the phase change and power are going to be telling the same story. Power is a little bit easier to pick out most of the time. Uh, so I would suggest you, uh, you take a look at that video. I'll have a link into that in the description for y'all. This is just to show the point. The yellow curve here is voltage uh, and the purple is off resonance. 
the green is slightly past the resonance frequency. And then we're now we're still talking about a more ideal transducer with a high coupling factor and a um, and a higher Q. So at, at, at off resonance, you see 90 degrees out of phase with the voltage and you see a lower amplitude, but at the resonance frequency or close to it, you have a larger amplitude current and that current is more in phase with the, with the voltage, uh, thus showing power delivery and indicating power delivery to your device. And it's behaving almost like a resistor in an ideal case. This is a circuit this is the other way to determine the resonance frequency uh, without having to measure both voltage and current. So if you have your frequency or, 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 or voltage generation source, it has an output impedance. And then you have, that. this is just how, how they work is that they have an output impedance. You can't put out infinite current or infinite power from a voltage source or uh, you have, it is limited internally. Um, and then you have your crystal and then you have your ground. So they're both grounded. Um, so what will actually happen to this V1 measured here is that as you approach the resonance frequency, the voltage delivered to your sample will dip. You'll see at the right of the resonance, like, so you'll have this voltage, voltage signal, like, let's say you're, you're sweeping up your frequency, you're, so your voltage peaks are going to come together, right? Uh, uh, so as soon as you hit your hit your hit a resonance frequency, you'll see the you'll see the amplitude start to decay, and it'll, it'll almost get like smashed at a resonance frequency. The reason that amplitude gets smashed is because now the voltage drop, a lot of that voltage drop is happening, happening over your resistor or over your output impedance of your function generator. Um, so let's say if you had a transducer that reaches 10 ohms at resonance, uh, but the output impedance of your function generator, like normal, is about 50 ohms, then you'll have a large drop in voltage at resonance as most of the voltage is going to drop over the output impedance. Um, now, if let's say if your uh, resonance, resonance impedance of your device was one kilo ohm, okay, then you would, you would never see a change in voltage be because um, the output impedance is way smaller still than your, uh, than your load. In that case, you can put, if that's one kilo ohm, you could put, let's say, a five kilo ohm resistor in series with your transducer, measure voltage after the five kilo ohm resistor, and then at that point, it'll, it'll simulate a larger function generator output impedance, which will allow that voltage to drop. So you can kind of measure, measure resonance only with one probe. Uh, that kind of makes it simple. And you could do something similar with current. So if you had a, if you had a, if you had a uh, uh, resistor on the ground side, you could also measure maximum current. This is kind of a more simple, straightforward way without any external components that you get that going. Um, the next part, the next way to measure resonance is to use impact or a physical, mechanical impact or transient elect and, and transient electrical signals. Uh, so I have two cases here. In the first case, I have a hammer and I hit this transducer, or you you can use a you can use a pen, you can use anything. You hit your transducer, uh, and then it will get excited. They'll have there'll be some like kind of like uh, scratchy area. Then it'll start to decay. Um, you can measure that voltage decay. If you leave it open circuit, it's going to be representative of the anti-resonance frequency. But if you either short circuit it and measure current, or if you provide a resistor in between, um, as long as the resistor value is a small, relatively smaller than the than the uh, impedance of your sample, you'll get a resonance according to your anti sorry, according to your resonance frequency at that point. So then you can measure the decay in voltage signal. So you, in this case, you don't have an excitation source. That's the difference between this one and the last one. You don't have a function generator. You don't have an excitation source, you can still find uh, your resonant frequency. Now, if your resonant frequency that you're after, um, you may stimulate many more resonant frequencies. Um, so if, but usually ultrasonic transducers are designed such that, um, uh, such that the first resonance frequency is the operating one. Uh, but if, honestly, if you're using a uh, piezoceramic bar or disc, this is not the way you want to do it. You don't want to hit it and stimulate a resonance. You, you can do it for a Langevin, a bolt clamp transducer, which is long. And when you hit it, you're going to be hitting metal, not the, you know, not the ceramic. That, in that case, you would be, I've done it a lot. I have a video on it. I'll also link to that. Uh, uh, and uh, it works kind of well. But it's kind of more of a test, more of, more of a let me see what I get test, not like a scientific test that you'd ever probably not put in your, um, uh, in, in let's say a, um, 
a manufacturing environment, you would use an electrical test. Because why wouldn't you? But we're just talking a lot, some about theory and also about um, understanding the device and what, what, what options you have available. You can still use this if you have a very controlled impact. Uh, I, I'd say you can still use it if necessary. The other case is a, what, what I'll call a uh, burst or a step method. So if you provide a step pulse or if you provide, and this is takes an excitation source, or if you provide a, let's say, frequency close to a resonance such that it sets to excited to a large extent, and then you short circuit your terminals. I'll tell you how to do that in a second. If you short circuit your terminals, then your frequency will automatically go to your natural frequency, which is the resonance frequency, and then it will decay slowly. So how do you provide this uh, beautiful kind of short circuit happening? So for low voltage situations, this is what I would do if you just have your device hooked up to your function generator. So you have your device, you have your function generator. I'll just draw it as a circle. And imagine there's a nice sine wave in there. And then you have a resistor. Let's call that resistor uh, a 50 ohm resistor. All right. And then you have your device here. And you have some terminals, like you have some leads coming out over your device. So what you do after you're driving your device, let's say you, you know your resonance frequency is about 43 kilohertz. So you, you generate a, four, a, a 43 kilohertz signal uh, and then you short your terminals. After shorting your terminals, and let's say there's a voltage probe hooked up and you can measure um, either, either a current probe or, or a small resistor so you can measure current. Um, now when you've shorted your transducer, you haven't shorted your function generator, you've just shorted that transducer itself. Uh, so um, when that happens, now your function generator is obviously shorted, but you have another, uh, you have a uh, series resistor, although I don't think function generators really get damaged when you short them, but if it did, you would have an, an additional resistor to channel and slow down the, sl the flow of current, but you would still achieve uh, the uh, short circuit over your transducer uh, that you desired. You could also do this in, in the opposite way to determine the anti-resonance frequency. And thus getting resonance and anti-resonance, you can determine the effective coupling factor. So in order to get anti-resonance frequency, you just simply disconnect. And once you disconnect, now, now the device will start to immediately oscillate it. And this is a more interesting effect, honestly. So the device will immediately start to oscillate at a, at a higher frequency, assuming you started from the lower one when you were driving resonance. Um, and uh, you will generate a voltage and uh, you can measure the frequency of that voltage using a oscilloscope, using uh, uh, the, um, the period in between um, the waves. And that is all for this episode, episode number 21. Uh, let me know what your questions are on measuring the resonance frequency. I'll link to some videos in the, in the description. I'll also uh, put in a link to get the uh, notes from this presentation. I will also uh, go ahead and uh, put a link to my consulting offerings for uh, if you if you are, have a ultrasonic transducer, part of an ultrasonic transducer uh, company who's developing such products, I provide consulting services. So feel free to uh, look, uh, follow the link and check out my services. Thanks for watching this uh, episode of The Shock Show. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow in episode number 28.